Hoje eu vou passar a apresentar uh, em inglês nosso palestrante do exterior. Um, so, uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Physics Colloquium. Um, today we have the privilege of uh, having a, a distinguished visitor from abroad, uh, Professor Sergei Frolov from the University of Pittsburgh um, is going to talk to us about Majorana fermion physics. Um, it's a very, very hot topic right now, uh, owing to the interest in generating uh, topological qubits, for instance. Um, and uh, uh, it's also kind of um, uh, illustrative of the age we're living in, because uh, uh, I don't know Professor Frolov personally, uh, but I interacted with him on Twitter. And uh, given this interaction on Twitter, um, I, I found out that he was a very, very good person to give um, this talk for us today. Um, Professor Frolov did his uh, bachelor's degree in Moscow. Then uh, he uh, received his PhD in physics at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Um, then went through a series of postdocs um, at the University of British Columbia, uh, at Delft University of Technology in the group of Leo Kovenhoven, and uh, has been a uh, professor, um, a member of his own group at the University of Pittsburgh since uh, 2012. He holds, uh, has received uh, several awards, including uh, an ONR Young Investigator Award, Alfred Sloan Research Fellow, NSF Career Award, um, and is current and uh, fellow of the National Academy of Sciences Cavley Frontiers of Science Program. So um, it's really a great privilege to have Professor Frolov with us today um, to teach us the physics of Majorana particles and how we discover them in nanowires. Professor Frolov, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Paolo, and uh, everyone who connected to this talk. Uh, yeah, I, it's a real shame. Uh, it's virtual, you know. Uh, actually, I had a plan to come to Brazil in the summer of 2020. Uh, of course, uh, that was not possible, but I'm still hoping that I will uh, visit my friends and maybe stop by some colleagues uh, in Brazil when, uh, when we are... Uh, uh, done with the virus. I hope everyone is doing okay. Um, well, uh, how do we discover Majorana particles is the title of my talk, which uh, implies that uh, things are not settled. Um, and uh, yes, it is the case. Uh, and this is maybe the reason why uh, people want to hear from me these days. Uh, so I will talk about that. Um, I will not talk about a recent uh, retraction from nature. Um, from um, quantized Majorana conductance, uh, although I can answer questions about that uh, because I, I did play a role in that process. Okay, here we go. This is my group at the University of Pittsburgh. Of course, people who uh, deserve uh, most of the credit and do uh, all of the work. Um, I will show data from Pang Yu, who is now uh, a postdoc at NYU. Uh, I will show data from uh, several other people. Uh, in the picture below, you can see our lab. Um, it has these machines, they're dilution refrigerators uh, that are used to generate uh, very low temperatures because the energy scale of Majorana is small. So you need to suppress the thermal um, broadening to see anything. So you need um, dilution refrigerators. And um, below you see our sponsors, which is just different forms of United States government. Uh, and uh, I have a special slide to thank all the people that we work with to provide us with these beautiful nanowires. So all the most experiments I'll show you are about nanowires and we don't grow them. It is a special skill set, art and science uh, to elaborate nanowires. And so all these groups are uh, our collaborators, uh, especially at Eindhoven and UCSB, but also Grenoble, Copenhagen, Toulouse, Montreal. We're very grateful for these collaborations. 
All right. Um, Majorana fermion uh, dates back from 1930s. Uh, it is a beautiful piece of physics. Um, it is a um, well, well known actually, a uh, solution of a Dirac equation found by Ettore Majorana, who is a person uh, of uh, most likely tragic fate, and he disappeared um, shortly after publishing this paper. Um, but uh, what he did is he solved the Dirac equation for certain uh, in certain conditions and found the real solutions. That's what um, I can tell you in short, not to make the talk too long. Um, and what it means is that um, the operator to create a particle is the same operator as to annihilate the particle expressed by this equation gamma dagger equal gamma for my run of fermions which means a particle is its own antiparticle. Um, you can also say that, you know, it's like a real number. If uh, um, another uh, generalized fermion is a complex number with real and imaginary part, this one has only a real part or only an imaginary part. And when we started um, presenting our results, we came up with a lot of beautiful analogies for what it means to be your own antiparticle. One of them is this uh, tennis ball in the water that makes one with its own reflection. And uh, another one is this painting by René Magritte, where reflection is exactly the same paradoxically as the object that is reflecting. Now, um, Majorana thought about it in context of uh, actual particles, uh, you know, what we call fundamental particles. Uh, he thought himself that neutrino might be a, a one of these real fermions, uh, but my work, uh, the work of my colleagues is in condensed matter physics, where we deal with quasi-particles, um, quasi-particles like phonons or actually quasi-electrons in a lattice. Um, and so uh, in this context, uh, Majorana is also its own antiparticle. Um, and uh, you can think of it as uh, a state that has equal weight in electrons and holes. So not like an exciton, which is two particles, electron and a hole. But um, if you know about it, like a bogaloob of quasi-particle in superconductors, which has is a superposition of electron and hole. And if the superposition is equal, then particle is its own antiparticle. So uh, one place to look for it is at the boundary between electrons and holes uh, at a symmetry point in a band structure of a solid. And here I show an example, which is a Dirac band structure, which is, you know, it's a solution of a Dirac equation. So it's justified, but you can find such band structures in materials like graphene or um, topological insulators, vial semi-metals. So such band structures exist. And at the symmetry point, which is even called a Dirac point, uh, you would have a particle as its own antiparticle. Uh, now we are actually not looking for Majorana in Vail or Dirac. Uh, band structures, but uh, it is possible to also look for them there. Now, when we um, look for them in uh, solid state physics, uh, they acquire additional properties that uh, Majorana himself uh, did not anticipate and makes actually a richer, more interesting uh, subject and even opens uh, avenues to applications. Uh, and that's non abelian properties. Now, if you think about um, a bunch of Majoranas on a plane in a two-dimensional world, we reduce dimensionality by uh, one, uh, then um, they don't behave like fermions or bosons. They are um, non-abelian anions, it is called. And that's because exchange rules of these particles are different from fermions or bosons. Uh, the exchange rules are written down here on the screen and they're due to Moore and Reed. Uh, and well, not for Majoranas, but for quantum hole systems, but still. Uh, so Moore and Reed, what they uh, said is that if you take two of these objects, well, you can actually encode um, a fermion, a complex fermion in them because each one is a real number. So you can combine them into a something like an electron. Uh, by writing down this combination, gamma one minus I gamma two. So out of two real numbers, you can make a complex number. So if you have two, um, you can encode a fermion. But then if you apply these rules and you swap their positions, then uh, gamma one becomes gamma, gamma two becomes minus gamma one. And 
the combination of them transforms from an electron with a C dagger to a hole with a C. A particle transforms into an antiparticle, but now with real fermions. Uh, so this is very, very unusual. Usually we cannot tell, the universe cannot tell us if we swapped two identical particles. Here, these are two identical particles. We swap them and the result is different. This is called non-abelian property. And this has not been demonstrated. This is something that we aspire to discover. Now, some people took it further, much further, and uh, thought, what if we had a plane of these Majoranas, a lot of them, and uh, we know that if we move them around, we change it from electron to hole, we can measure that. And so it means that we can store and manipulate information stored in um, relative positions of uh, multiple Majorana fermions. And so this is how uh, topological quantum computing has been born. Uh, and in fact, um, yes, the information you can store is quantum. So you can store qubit information in it. And why people uh, like to talk about this is because maybe uh, this kind of approach offers also extra protection for quantum information. So this is depicted by this noise here. You see how this little wiggling uh, here is noise, so local fluctuation and position of Majorana does not affect quantum information because the world lines of this process have not been unwound. So they don't, didn't uncross each other. And that means that quantum information stays as where it was. So the process of moving them around in space time is called braiding, right? kind of intuitive, although it, it is a concept as I understand from uh, mathematical topology theory, uh, but um, also kind of think looks like braiding. And uh, this um, braiding experiment is hard but it is also um, extremely interesting to do. And you can think of it as something that would give you this application, a quantum gate for a quantum computer, moving Majoranas, changing quantum information. I like to think about it from a fundamental physics point of view. I think it would be wonderful to establish a new class of particles next to fermions and bosons. And uh, I think of it as a, an effort like CERN or LIGO, uh, something big and fundamental. And uh, the reason why it's big is because it is very hard, very hard to do. I will probably not be able to do it in just my lab. I will need a lot of collaborations with uh, chemists and material scientists, computer scientists and electrical engineers to build this apparatus, to move them around and detect that this has happened. Uh, but I would very much like to be part of these efforts. And this is why I'm working on this and uh, this is what I'm going to tell you about. Now, um, there is a controversy now on the experimental side of these efforts, uh, but on the theoretical side, at least the basic theory is not controversial and robust. It's solid. It originated from Kitaev in 2001, who wrote down this toy model, uh, toy model because it uh, includes spinless fermions, which don't really exist in nature. But then Fu and Kane in 2008 took it into the realm of reality and made the first proposal based on existing materials, topological insulators. But what we are interested in is these 2010 papers uh, that uh, propose to do it in uh, semiconductor nanowires, the ones I am working with and I has been, have been working with already in 2010. But let me uh, motivate it for you uh, what Kitaev came up with. Uh, I already told you that out of two Majoranas, you can build a, a re, a, an actual complex fermion. You can also think about it the other way around. Uh, an electron is two Majoranas flying together. Right? Each electron can be decomposed in two Majoranas, but you cannot separate them. And what you need, what is interesting is to break them apart, break, break the electron apart in two parts. So what Kitaev did is he put, put um, along a chain, one dimensional chain of um, fermions, electrons. So these are the boxes. These are the C boxes and each has two stars, each has two Majoranas. And then what he uh, noticed is that if you 
introduce superconducting pairing into this. It happens to be P wave because it's one dimensional and spinless. Um, then the boundaries of these boxes uh, shift. Uh, they shift by half a period. So uh, they kind of break each fermion apart. They make new fermions like this. These two stars, these two stars are the new fermions. But what you see is that there is one on the end and one on the other end, uncoupled, unpaired. And that's the name of Kitaev's paper, unpaired Majorana fermions. So this is what we are after. We want to unpair an electron into two Majorana fermions. Uh, there are many different Majorana platforms. Um, Kitaev model has been mapped onto different existing materials. And there is a wonderful variety, fascinating physics. And I often get asked, well, which one is a leading platform? Uh, which one is, uh, has a better chance? And um, the answer is, it is really just a cloud like this. And uh, researchers around the world are exploring different systems uh, simultaneously. Uh, there isn't a clear leader. There are some that are explored more and some that are explored less. But if you want to assess for yourself which one uh, you prefer, then I uh, propose that you ask these four questions that I have on the screen. Is it reasonable? Is the physics uh, marginal, like under very extreme circumstances, it may be possible, or is it robust for realistic parameters? You should have Majorana. Is it verifiable? Is there an experimental probe like the tunneling experiments I will show you? Is there something like this exist for the system that you could say, aha, there is a Majorana there? Uh, if you care about the big prize, you can ask yourself, well, uh, is it braidable? Okay, is there a mechanism to manipulate them, move them around and detect the outcome of this braiding operation, which is different than just detecting Majorana? And okay, if you care to make an actual device out of it, like a quantum computer, you may also wanna ask, is it scalable? Can you make thousands of them or millions of them? Uh, you know, can you deploy a factory? Uh, Majoranas in nanowires uh, answer all of these questions uh, with high degree of confidence, positively, braidable, scalable, realistic, uh, verifiable. Uh, although we obviously don't have a scaled uh, chip any uh, at this moment in time. But uh, this is what this is all about. Uh, these 2010 papers have proposed a relatively simple recipe how to get to unpaired Majorana. So you need a nanowire, which is like a one-dimensional system of Kitaev, a one-dimensional nanowire. Um, then you need to put superconductivity in it, like Kitaev did. And this you do literally by putting a superconductor, like aluminum, niobium, a, a simple superconductor on top of your nanowire. So that's how you introduce superconductivity by proximity effect, it's called. Then you need spinless, you need spinless fermions. You don't have spinless fermions, but you can spin polarize electrons that you have in a nanowire by magnetic field. So you have magnetic field. Now you have a problem because uh, superconductivity likes to pair electrons like this in a spin singlet. And then magnetic field, of course, likes to flip all the spins in the same direction in a triplet. So you have a problem. And this is where spin orbit coupling, ingredient number two on the screen comes to help because with spin orbit coupling, you couple singlet and triplet, you make peace between magnetic field and superconductivity, allow it to survive to the regime where you can find Majorana. So that's the idea, that's the recipe. The numbers make a lot of sense, um, at least at the zeroth level, the first level, maybe when you get into the nuances of material science of nanowires, you start getting a little doubt, but it is a very good idea. Now, what kind of measurements do we do? Well, uh, we do these kind of uh, tunneling experiments. So we make contacts to this nanowire and we send current through. Now, Majoranas are supposed to be located where these stars are at the ends of the superconductor that we put down on the nanowire. And so we uh, apply a voltage and we measure current and we tunnel across this hump, the green hump, which is a tunneling barrier. Um, and when we tunnel, we get tunneling characteristics. And in these, we find a kind of zero bias 
conductance feature, a peak, and uh, this has been predicted by theory uh, to be a signature of Majorana fermions. And what is especially uh, appealing about this peak is that it does not move from zero bias. So here we change magnetic field from zero to 490, half a Tesla. And at around 100 millitesla, all these curves are just offset for clarity. At around 100 millitesla, a zero bias peak emerges and it stays at zero bias as if the state has no spin. It doesn't disperse with Zeeman energy. Here is another uh, example of this. Now, this is from Pittsburgh. This is also our data from 2012 when I was a postdoc in Delft. This is from Pittsburgh, uh, where um, now it's color scale, so I can introduce it to you. Uh, it's conductance, so DV, D, uh, DI DV, and it's in the units of 2 squared over H, a quantum of conductance. And dark blue means uh, dark blue means low conductance, and uh, red means high conductance. So this is a very narrow peak. It appears at finite field and it stays there. So if I give you Zeeman energy, uh, then if there is a state that, that was a spin, it would start here at the bottom and it would cross all the way out here in this window of energy if it had spin, because the G factor of this material, this is indium antimonide, is 50. So you have a large Zeeman energy. Okay, so we found this evidence of Majorana, uh, this a sticky, resist, resilient zero bias peak. But um, a few years after we did that, came an interesting surprise. Nature had a surprise for us. There was another possibility to explain the same data. Okay, so we mapped it out pretty well, and we were still left room for doubt, but we were to be honest with you, pretty sure that it was Majorana, but uh, then um, interesting realization on set. And this is basically my way to summarize it. What you after, what you want is this top picture, an electron split in two parts, green and red, that are not overlapping. That's the topological Majorana modes separated and protected. Now, if you have uh, disorder, non-idealities, or if your nanowire is short, the two Majoranas can be slightly overlapping, and then we call it partially separated states. That's still interesting, but uh, does not offer benefits for qubits. But what is also possible is uh, there is a zero bias peak, but it's not due to any kind of topological state. It's due to a single electron with two Majoranas flying together, not separated at all, like the bottom here, two red and green wave functions have exactly the same shape. And that has a name, it's called Andreev bound states. So Majorana versus Andreev. These states are also interesting, but uh, they're not topological. And what these Andreev states are, um, are states that are partially confined by the nanowire wave functions and partially confined by the superconductor and Andreev processes. Andreev process is the kind of process where you put two electrons in the superconductor and uh, a hole reflects uh, into the normal metal. But you can also think about it this way. Um, Think about a small quantum object, like a small box called quantum dot with its own energy U. And then it's coupled to a large reservoir, which happens to be superconducting with a rate gamma. This is also known as an Anderson impurity model. And this may be known to you uh, as, as such. And it has this phase diagram of doublet and singlet states. And as you go from doublet to singlet, um, a state, uh, energy difference between doublet and singlet becomes zero. And when that happens, there is a zero bias peak. So here's some examples. This is an Andrea bound state at zero magnetic field on the left here. And then at finite field, due to Zeeman energy, energy difference between singlet and doublet ground states vanishes, there's a zero bias peak. Here is a kind of an I shape, but there is a zero bias peak here and here. And under certain circumstances, some fine tuning uh, of the system, this can be quite persistent. So here I have one zero bias peak that uh, persists for several hundred millitesla, which is quite considerable. Where generic behavior expected of Andreev states is this kind of crossing behavior. So they say I'm gonna split and go through zero and pull apart, but sometimes they stick. 
And so uh, the field found itself in this situation where we have similar data, but uh, two different interpretations. So to illustrate this, here is on the left, a paper that uh, interpreted such zero bias peaks as Majorana. In this color scale, there are these uh, white extended features in the middle uh, of the figure here. And then a couple of years later, uh, this paper finds absolutely no Majorana, zero possibility for Majorana in that experiment. So they made a small dot and studied states in that. So there is no long nanowire here. And then we have uh, an extended peak, much like on the left, and that's Andreev. Okay, so um, since then we learned that there are multiple ways to make the peak stick to zero bias and look like Majorana. One of them is Majorana, it's this one. And then uh, there's uh, at least three other ways and they all have to do with energy level repulsion. So for instance, let's look at the lower left. Uh, there is one level here that wants to go to zero and then wants to go away from zero, but there is a green level interacting with it, hybridizing and pushing it to zero. So due to interactions, it gets pushed to zero. This is also in the upper right, another example of level repulsion, anti-crossings, but now with all these blue states above the superconducting gap, pushing down on the level below the gap, making this kind of extended state. And this is just a bottom right a case of disorder. So you have many states reaching zero at different uh, points, uh, but then making an illusion of an extended state at zero altogether. So we have to sort through these uh, possibilities in our future experiments, in our new experiments. And uh, I recently came up with these five criteria derived from existing work that if you see these five things, and if you see them in the same wire, in the same experiment, in the same sample, then the likelihood that you have Majorana is pretty high. And it's basically about cross-checking for consistency. The theory of Majorana predicts uh, a certain behavior, that there is a certain space of parameters where Majorana should appear, how it should look. And that's uh, what uh, this list of uh, criteria is. And the most important one that maybe is the toughest to demonstrate is the fundamental fact that there always have to be two Majoranas, one on the left end, one on the right end of the nanowire. Because remember, it's a split electron, electron split in two halves. So if you have a zero bias peak measuring on the left, you also have to have one measuring on the right. Now, um, this is my survey of all the papers that claimed Majorana so far. And this first one is us. We started it all in Delft. Uh, and then with the green squares, I mark uh, which of the five signatures that I put on the list have been reported in these papers. And you can see that you know, none of the papers report all five. And so that leaves room for doubt whether it's Majorana and leaves possibility to explain it as Andreev states. And in fact, you could explain all of these papers, every single one as Andreev states. So we need more work. And in particular, you see the last column, this two-end correlation uh, is just all no's. Nobody, nobody claimed that for any of the experiments. People have tried and including us, we have tried, we have a paper from this year about it. And so what, the way it looks is you just uh, double the experiment. Here you have in the middle a superconductor on a nanowire. The yellow is a nanowire here. And then you have a tunneling probe for measuring current on the left, and you add a second probe on the right. So you're looking for now yellow and red stars, the two Majoranas on the two ends. So you should have two zero bias peaks and they should behave the same way. So if there is a peak here, there should be a peak here. If there is no peak here, there should not be a peak here. No matter what you change, gate, magnetic field, any parameters that you have in this system. That makes sense, right? And you measure two currents simultaneously, flowing to the left and flowing to the right. Okay, well, and what we find is that, yes, we can find zero bias peaks. Uh, we can find them on the left side um, and we can find them on the right side, but they're not correlated. 
if there is one on the left, doesn't mean there is one on the right. This is kind of summarized in this um, plot here. We change gate voltage as gate and plot onsets of zero bias peak on the left and on the right. And sometimes they are correlated like this yellow point here. Oops. But uh, generically, they're not correlated. And so we, it's maybe disappointing uh, to not find that. But at the same time, um, you know, the good news is we learned, we now know how it should look and which experiment we should do to find them. We should do this two side correlation of zero bias peaks. And that would give us in combination with four other metrics for Majorana, this will give us good degree of confidence. So this is, this is one half of my answer to the question I asked in the beginning. How do we discover Majorana fermions? Technique wise, measurement technique wise, this is it. Five criteria in the same nanowire. Now, uh, the other half, and uh, here I use a, a plot that just came out yesterday in uh, physics magazine of APS. The other half is improvements in material science. So uh, here on the screen, I have all kinds of topological phases uh, that people have been working on as a function of two parameters, the energy scale of the phase predicted or observed in experiment, Energy scale means um, how much energy the system saves, right, to go into that phase. So let's say topological insulators can be seen at room temperature. That puts them at tens of milli electron volt in energy. And then uh, quantum hole effect, fractional quantum hole effect is seen at a few Kelvin. And Majoranas are seen below one Kelvin. So that puts them further down on the energy. And the horizontal axis is disorder, mean free path, MFP, from nanometers to millimeters. Nanometers is large disorder, millimeters is low disorder. And you can even convert that to energy as well, because large disorder means your parameters of your bands fluctuate a lot and uh, the size of your phase shrinks. There's a lot of disorder, right? And uh, okay, there is this fog of hope, right? So if you're in the fog of hope, your material is almost good enough to, that you should be able to see it, but you don't quite see it. There is always another possibility, for instance, Andreev states created by imperfections in your nanowire, even though your nanowire is already great with very high mobility, tens of thousands, and it's uh, optimized for other parameters there is still uh, some possibility for another explanation. And you're in the fog of hope. You're trying to distinguish what do we see in this fog? Do we see a Majorana? We hope it's Majorana, right? That's a hope is the word of the day, Carlos. That's why I said hope is the word of the day. Um, okay, so uh, what is the solution? If we are in this situation, the solution is material science and the material engineering. By improving our materials, we can either move our face to the left with less disorder, or we can move it up to a higher energy scale, right? By playing with materials. And that's why I pretty much became a material scientist for the last uh, several years in my lab. Um, I work with the nanowire growers with, um, and we improve methods of fabrication. So we have all these ideas that I'm not gonna go through, but I just list them on the screen for how we can make our devices better, our nan nanowire is better, even better, right? Because like I said, they're already pretty good, even better. And why we need them so good, um, for those of you who know about superconductivity, I can give you a short motivation. Um, superconductivity is actually not sensitive to disorder. That's a beautiful thing about superconductors. There is a, an Anderson theorem, it's called, which says that uh, disorder doesn't kill, but magnetic impurities do. Um, now, we don't have magnetic impurities, but our superconductivity is unusual. It's a P wave. It's a triplet, triplet superconductivity. And triplet superconductivity is sensitive to any disorder, also non-magnetic. So any disorder is bad. And so that's a motivation for why we need, the better the sample, the clearer the signal. 
So in terms of actual results, here is one thing uh, that I wanted to share with you, something we are uh, pretty proud of, and it gives us hope. Uh, again, it came out uh, in publication after a long uh, delay uh, recently. The editor even apologized for the delay. Um, and so this is uh, where we try to make a new combination of uh, superconductor and semiconductor. And semiconductor is actually the same. It's indium antimonide nanowire, like in the previous experiments that I showed you. But the superconductor is interesting. It's tin. Tin is um, um, well unexplored for such devices, underexplored, um, and it has some advantages. First of all, uh, its uh, energy scale, you know, moving the phase up, energy scale is better than aluminum, which was uh, the best superconductor to work with until recently. So here in this plot in the middle, I show this energy scale. It's the superconducting gap. It looks pretty good. There is no states inside the gap. Uh, and uh, it is about three times the gap of aluminum. So that's improving the energy scale, pushing it up maybe above one Kelvin, pushing it up in energy. Uh, it's also magnetic field resilient. It shows this um, uh, parity conservation effect, which could come in handy for if we want to make qubits out of this. Um, so this is all looking good. Um, now, another important thing about it that gives us a lot of hope is that uh, the lattices of tin and indium antimonide are not matched at all. There is no relationship between these lattices. So these tin grains are just stuck to indium antimonide and it gives uh, good results, same as with aluminum. Now, um, previously, there was a lot of um, uh, you know, this kind of thinking that we need epitaxial matching. So the lattice constant of superconductor and the lattice constant of semiconductor have to be the same so that the atomic layers gradually transition from one to the other uh, in order to see uh, these kind of superconducting properties that I have on the screen. And if this is not the case, if this is not necessary, that opens the possibilities. You can combine many different materials that are not matched and maybe you will have good results. And so we can now, armed with this knowledge, explore a large space of materials and maybe find better, larger energy scale or lower disorder materials to push us out of the fog of hope and into the clear. That would help a lot with all the experiments that we do. Okay, well, in the last uh, couple of minutes, um, I want to come back to braiding. Remember braiding, the holy grail experiment that I really want to do? Um, well, I need my runners for that. And uh, it's a bummer that we kind of don't have them yet. But um, comes to the rescue an actual existing quantum computer that we can log into uh, thanks to IBM. So Maybe a lot of you know that uh, IBM, you just have a website, you create a login, you log in and you get access to the quantum computer. So what uh, we decided to do during COVID when the lab was shut down, we decided to go to this quantum computer and uh, simulate braiding of Majorana modes on a quantum computer. Well, I ended up not being on this paper, uh, but I really like this work. It's by my colleagues in Pittsburgh and some IBM guys. And uh, because there's IBM guys, we could actually, well, my colleagues could hack into the IBM quantum computer and change the gates. Uh, so normally you're given a set of quantum gates like CNOD or Adamar gates, but they created their own gates like these A of data gates and uh, other gates which were cheaper. So they don't decohere the quantum computer as much as the CNOT gates. CNOT gates are very expensive. And so what they did is they used a beautiful piece of physics, which is called jordan Wigner transformation. And this transformation, look it up if you don't know it. It's wonderful. It's easy to follow. And it maps Majorana operators, gammas, in a chain like Kitaev chain, onto spin operators, sigmas, in an Ising chain, Ising spin chain. 
So you can go from Majorana chain to Eisen chain. And um, well, qubits in a quantum computer are spins, they're Ising spins. So if you map it to spins, you map it to qubits, then you can model uh, this braiding process. And so with these hacked gates and the Jordan Wigner transformation, uh, these guys could model the quantum dynamics of braiding. And uh, the results uh, at the bottom, these colorful plots, some of these are simulated and some of them are run on a quantum computer. So IBM Q Athens is on a quantum computer. It's a little bit worse than simulated. And these data always look anticlimactic on a quantum computer. It's just bars, it's just the probabilities to find the right answer, but the probability is good. We wanted Psi plus and we got Psi plus. So this is good. So it's possible to do braiding uh, with simulated Majoranas on a quantum computer. Uh, these are all positives. You don't have topological protection, of course. IBM machine doesn't have it. so you. You can just get it out of uh, simulating my runners. You also don't have topological protection more generically in upon jo Jordan Wigner transformation, you lose it because you have a chain of spins and uh, any spin can flip is free to flip. And then uh, you go into an excited state. So there is no, no gap, no protection in this model. Okay. Um, I think I'm pretty much on time. So uh, I'm gonna stop here. And uh, yeah, these are the conclusions. Um, we haven't discovered Majorana. The good news is we have come up with a method how to tell Majorana when we see it. We will know it when we see it with our five criteria, okay? And uh, we have a lot of hope to get out of the fog of hope through materials improvements, working with our brilliant, nanowire growers and improving our own facilities to make better devices. And uh, as soon as we find them for real now, I will let you know. I'll be happy to let you know. And thank you so much for connecting and for listening. Thank you very much for, for the excellent colloquium. And uh, we are open for questions. Uh, people in the the YouTube can write in the chat. Uh, people in the in the Zoom room, please uh, open your mic and ask the question. I, I have a question, if I'm allowed to. Please go ahead. All right. Um, thank you for uh, this very nice introductory talk. I'm sure my students enjoyed it, and I'll probably quiz them later. <laughs> I have still an hour to go. Guys, if you need any help, just send me an email. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, I see a lot of um, uh, parallels, uh, some parallels at least with topological insulators as far as the difficulties um, with um, realizing and actually having something that is robust. You know, for instance, um, you know, we all claim that you know, things are robust against disorder. But paradoxically, we still are after clean systems, right? And, and this is a great, you know, there's been a great deal of effort now trying to improve the system. And, 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 and it seems to be that uh, what we really should be looking for um, should be actually materials of a larger gap as opposed to you know, improving the, the quality in terms of disorder, because that would solve any problem, right? Because as I remember, I think there's some work by, um, from Molenkamp's group showing that, um, I mean, there is some intrinsic uh, sort of limitation because the gap in a topological insulator, it sort of varies too much, you know, too much, right? And it's tiny. So it's hard to get rid of this uh, gap fluctuation and it's hard to have the Fermi level there, you know, within the gap. So in a way, it's sort of the same thing here, right? The, the robustness has to do with, with how, how big the gap is. So shouldn't we be focusing effort in actually trying to come up with material, material that has a larger kind of gap? 
Yeah, well, um, I uh, agree and disagree. I mean, I think it's a, it's a multi-parameter search, right? Um, so you can see, for instance, you can make uh, Majorana in topological insulators, right? For instance, you can, uh, you see uh, 3D topological insulators are on top of my diagram. So energy scale is large. The ones you're talking about are more 2D, right? So they're down here. They have a lower energy scale and there is more uncertainty about their observation. But with 3D, I would say the data is uh, pretty clear that the topological state is has been established. Um, things like ARPES and uh, whatnot. Uh, now let's put a super let's put a high temperature superconductor on it with a the same energy scale as the topological state itself, uh, and we should be able to see uh, very robust Majorana, right? But uh, disorder and um, you know sp uh, spurious surface states that are not topological are a problem. So it push it would push our Majorana into this corner here in a, in a, in a beyond even the fog of hope because of such high disorder. So disorder also plays a role. It's not just about, uh, remember, P wave superconductivity is destroyed by disorder very strongly, much more so than uh, just the topological insulator state. Thank you, thank you. So can, hi, Oscar, can I ask a question? Hi, okay. Hi, Sergey. Thank you for, for your talk. Very, very instructive. Uh, I saw your, your Fog of Hope chart on Twitter. I actually follow you there. Very, very interesting. And actually, I, I have two questions about that. The first is I, I like the, you know, that you put the fractional quantum Hall effect in there. Because we, the, with the fractional quantum Hall effect, we were in the fog of hope, they say back in the 80s, right? And then there was a large improvement in the materials in gallium arsenide, heat restructures, you know, going to high, ultra high mobilities. And then you, you moved out of the fog of hope. Now, the question is, can you do that with the nanowires? I mean, can you improve the, the materials to, to that degree that, that were done for the fractional Hall effect in order to, to get out of the fog of hope? And the second question is, uh, some of the other platforms that you mentioned, such as uh, magnetic atoms on the superconducting surface to be probed with STM, they are in a higher energy scale, right? You're talking at, you know, atoms on surfaces. So, Maybe uh, you, you can also go to a higher energy scale with do in, in that platform and, and try to you know, get out of the fog of hope through that uh, uh, path, so to speak. Yeah, thanks, uh, Luis. Uh, great questions. Uh, so let's talk about fractional quantum Hall effect because it's on this screen. Um, yeah, so it is out of the fog of hope when uh, the basic fractional quantum Hall effect is concerned, absolutely, and that's uh, represented uh, by this left hand here. The reason why it's still sticking into the fog of hope, that's the, that's the topological, uh, the, the, the non-abelian uh, part of it, uh, so the, the five halves, uh, uh, interferometry measurements and so on. So, uh, so because I made a diagram with uh, these kind of effects in mind, I, I pushed it um, a little bit into the fog of hope. Um, now um, you can see that Majoranas are shifted to the right from fractional quantum Hall effect. And of course, mobility in nanowires is lower than in uh, state-of-the-art gallium arsenide uh, quantum well materials. Uh, and uh, I, um, I don't know if we can push it to the left uh, significantly, maybe just a little bit. Maybe this a little bit will be enough to pull out a clear physics demonstration. The reason why we can't put it all the way is because um, in gallium arsenide, where fraction quantum Hall effect is most studied, the, the electrons are buried uh, pretty deep underneath the surface. And so that and other uh, numerous improvements that people have done protect them from uh, disorder. Now in a nanowire, it's all surface. 
electrons interact with the surface all the time. So one way that we're trying to uh, improve that situation is this dark blue layer here, okay? We put a, a surface shell, a shell that would protect electrons inside, inside. And uh, so we're doing some experiments to see does the mobility improve when we do that? So, so far unclear, but there is a lot to optimize. Um, so this is one way we can maybe push it a little bit out of the fog of hope, but a little bit higher mobility. Now, as far as uh, spins on uh, um, surfaces are concerned, that's a beautiful uh, field and uh, a lot of good people working on it. Some uh, promising demonstrations are being done and uh, maybe they get it. Uh, so far, I don't think there is a, um, you know, very conclusive evidence. Some of the same alternative explanations still apply. Mm -hmm. um, that's my opinion. Um, now, uh, the energy scale is not that much higher because it's determined by the superconductor. And so the superconductor, okay, you go from aluminum, they use maybe lead. Lead is a little bit better, kind of like tin that we use now. So it's a factor of five, let's say better than aluminum. So, but, but that's the improvement in the energy scale, right? The, going from tin, uh, from aluminum to lead, that, that's the improvement. Uh, that, that would be the, you know, the spin orbit is unknown, uh, depends on where it comes from. If it comes from lead, it's pretty high. So that's good. Um, and um, disorder, well, um, in principle, it's atomically clean, right? So yeah. at, at that atomic scale, it's uh, pretty good. Of course, it's all compressed. It's uh, just a few atoms across, but mm -hmm. um, I, I guess it can be very clean at that scale. Uh, yeah. Now, in terms of braiding and the scaling, this is uh, not a promising approach sure. to use uh, atoms on surfaces. Uh, but for demonstration of Majorana, I think it's very good. Okay, thank you. Um, I also have a question, if I may ask it. Yeah, Please go ahead. Um, so thank you, Sergey, for your talk. It was a very nice talk. Um, in your, the first part of your talk, you mentioned this quasi Majorana states. And you said, um, you said that they, you can't do braiding with them, essentially, right? Um, but from what I understand, uh, if you have a finite nanowire, there is always going to be a, an overlap between the two Majorana peaks, even if this overlap is ne ne negligible or very small, but it's still going to be there. So my question is, is there a well-defined criteri criteria for distinguishing this quasi Majorana states from the true Majorana states? Um, well, I guess the true Majorana states really only uh, possible in an infinite wire. But, but in an infinite wire that does have two ends. Um, so in any finite size wire, like you said, there will be some overlap. Um, so um, what, I, what I said, I maybe went a little bit fast through this, um, is not that you cannot do braiding. You can, you can do braiding. Uh, it's just that there is no topological protection. And what I mean by that is this. Um, you can think of the lifetime of um, uh, quantum state in two Majoranas as a inverse of their overlap. I mean, it's very intuitive. Uh, overlap gives you some energy like exchange energy of two wave functions and uh, inverse of energy is time. So when the two Majoranas overlap, uh, you introduce a time scale into your situation uh, and you have to do everything that you want to do, like your braiding, uh, at the time scale that's faster than what's given by the overlap. So it gives a lifetime or a limit on your uh, operation speed uh, for your braiding. So your topological protection only lives as long as um, the overlap allows it to. And that also gives you a framework for thinking about it. If they're strongly overlapping, there is uh, an extremely short time 
that you have to do your operation. If they are very weakly overlapping, you can take your time. You can go have a coffee and then come back, braid a little more and so on. I see, thank you very much. Uh, this leads to a second related question. That is, is there already a standard for the this time scale or the splitting energy that, uh, that you were aiming for? Uh, well, um, like I said, I am thinking of it as a fundamental uh, challenge, uh, like CERN discovering a Higgs boson, right? Uh, so if I can convince my colleagues like you that I have braided, I have succeeded. Uh, and that means uh, the time scale is not so important. Although, uh, of course, uh, there is some uh, minimum time scale that I would like to have in order to perform all this complex manipulation and readout. Um, but um, if you think about it from the point of view of quantum computing, then yeah, there, there is a, a very easy way to set the standard and it's set by the best qubits out there, okay? So, you know, if we take a superconducting qubit, uh, we can have a hundred microsecond uh, coherence time uh, reliably. Well, okay, not every group can have that, but um, already multiple group, groups can have that. So uh, if I uh, do a topologically protected qubit, which has coherence time less than hundred microseconds, um, that's not so impressive, right? Uh, so I think it's just said by that. Uh, you know, you need at least 100 microseconds to be better than a transmon, uh, and probably a lot more to, to really uh, make it worth changing all the technology and go from transmons to nanowires. I see. Thank you very much. It was a very good answer. Maybe I can add one little thing also that. For, for me to do braiding, and just as a proof of principle, probably one microsecond or so will be enough because, uh, you know, in the early days of qubits, even we worked with like 10 nanoseconds. So we have all the electronics to manipulate and read out uh, things on that time scale. Okay. So we will be able to tell that something happens with, let's say, one microsecond. Thank you very much. Carlos, please go ahead. All right. Um, could you talk briefly about the hard gap? Um, I found it amazing that um, you, um, you you said you don't need any more, um, you know, the lattice, you know, the matching, right, between the, you know, the aluminum and as people used to believe. So what is going on there? You, the interface doesn't have to be lattice matched. So. There's no dislocation or anything like that that forms. Are you still growing things within some critical thickness where you have a coherent, you know, growth or something? Uh, okay, yes, yeah, that's great. Um, let me first show you this data again. Uh, this are uh, data with soft gap. Okay, so because maybe not everybody knows what we're talking about. Um, so uh, let's look at the graph on the left, this uh, original data uh, at zero magnetic field without any Majorana uh, possibility. Uh, we have this shape, two spikes and a suppression in the middle. Uh, two spikes are well known. It's uh, BCS peaks in the density of states created by expelling uh, states due to superconductivity from the middle of the gap around Fermi level to higher energies. Now, in the ideal scenario, there is absolutely nothing in the middle. And we have this background, and this is called a soft gap. When there is nothing, it's called hard gap. Uh, now, uh, soft gap is bad. Uh, but uh, it's uh, too naive to just say those words. Uh, you have to qualify them. Uh, there are two ways in which soft gap is bad. Uh, first way is it makes it absolutely terrible to make qubits. Um, that's because uh, all this uh, signal here inside the gap, that's states. And uh, these states can couple to your qubit states and make the decoherence very fast. What we just discussed uh, 
the previous question that uh, Lucas asked. Uh, second way it's bad is that uh, there could be something hiding there uh, that um, makes it difficult to identify our signal. Like uh, here, a zero bias peak is here, but there's maybe other states that we don't see because of the background. And uh, for now, at this moment in time, we're not making qubits and I don't care about qubits, uh, but I, it is still nice to have hard gap, to have uh, this clear, clear view. Like uh, ideally your experiment is nothing. And then in the middle, there is a Majorana peak. Okay, so now let's look at the new signal. Okay, well, uh, so this is hard gap. Uh, here we have the two peaks I talked about, the BCS peaks. And in the middle, there is nothing. This is uh, how it looks on the log scale, logarithmic scale. So the background is uh, rather small, a factor of a hundred uh, below um, the background. And uh, okay, I mean, it, it varies when you change gates and so on. Um, and okay, now I can actually get to Carlos's question, which was uh, that he finds it surprising that without requirements of epitaxy, uh, this is possible. Uh, I am not surprised. Actually, those aluminum devices also have grains, also have disorder, and uh, still this works. Um, I think it is all about uh, creating extra states at the interface between the superconductor and the semiconductor. And uh, when we work with niobium, uh, which is what we did a lot, like in the first experiments, uh, the way we clean the surface and niobium itself is probably uh, prone to creating additional states in between, in between the nanowire and the, and the shell. Uh, and those states make the gap soft. And if they don't appear, uh, then uh, there is no problem. So the cleaning method we used here and the materials we used here are just not uh, amenable to formation of these states. So we have a hard gap. That's my understanding at the moment. And I don't have very good proof of it, to be fair. Yeah, I said I was surprised because people made a big deal about the epitaxy, right? These, uh, when it came out, you know, I guess. And I think it was in Marcus's group, right, Peter? Yes, and those were beautiful results. Yeah. Uh, and they shaped, uh, to be honest with you, the entire direction of Microsoft research on this topic. Uh, in the grand scheme of making big claims, uh, this one is not the top, but it, it was pretty big, yes. And uh, we, we demonstrate that it is not... Is there any strain? Is it a strained structure? Yeah. And that doesn't, you know, I mean, people don't really know yet, right? And you know, whether this Okay, I mean, I have to also qualify it like this. I mean, in this first paper that we published, we did not try to look for Majorana. And uh, when we try to look for Majorana, we may run into problems that this, these grains and this disorder still plays a role, detrimental role. So we will have to see. But at least in these measurements, uh, it looks beautiful. Great, thank you. Are there for further questions? Uh, I just have one one more. Uh, uh, so Sergey, yeah, I, I noticed you you put them on the list for you know the you know, the bottom of the list those experiments with the full shell on the wires, where right? they do they they look for. In Majorana's in the little parks, uh, uh, no lobes, as they say. So, uh, do you do you think that there 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 could be? Um, I don't know. Some since 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 now you have the full shell nanowires, couldn't the the the, the disorder effects be reduced somehow? That's or or the claims that uh, comes out of Copenhagen. On the other hand, I, I saw the papers by, by Katsaros where they, they see that they, they only yeah. saw, see Andre bound states, but I just wanna know if these, I mean, these is the compar are comparable uh, devices as the, the regular nanowires with half shells. 
I, I think they are, yeah. I mean, I think that aluminum shell is actually made of grains and um, it's basically the same thing. And uh, yes, you mentioned, so we're talking about this second to last paper on the list. Yes. Which according to me, does not demonstrate all the five uh, key signatures. Uh, and uh, yeah, the interesting development for that paper is that uh, another group um, uh, of Georges Katsaros from uh, IST Austria have taken the same wires, uh, measured the same data, and published a paper last summer saying it's not my error. Yeah. Yes. Um, I can also tell you that uh, we asked the authors of the two papers, how can it be um, that you arrived to such diametrical uh, conclusions and ask them to share data with us. And uh, if you're really curious, uh, the science paper guys did put additional data on Zenodo server uh, that was not published with the paper was published later. And uh, yeah, you can see for yourself what you think. We are analyzing those data right now. All right. That's all I can yeah. say at this moment. I'll, I'll be looking on Twitter. <laughs> can I ask a question? Thank you. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you, sir. You heard my talk. Uh, so on this slide, I understand that you came up with this, these uh, five criteria, right? Yes. So were people, before your experiments, uh, were people looking, uh, I mean, were they trying to sort of respect all these uh, five ingredients or they were only interested, for, uh, for example, uh, in these sticky peaks or oscillations? Well, uh, some people have been and some haven't. Um, uh, I have been. Um, actually, I wrote down these criteria. I, I publicized them recently. I wrote them down when I was still uh, in Delft, uh, when we wrote the first paper. And then we were very optimistic. And we thought that next year we will do this experiment with these five things. So I wrote down a list that was very similar to this. And it's in my early grant proposals to the government that we will look for all these signatures. And I have tried. So this is my paper 2017. And according to me, I got to three in one nanowire. And uh, I even can claim the fourth one, but certainly not the fifth one. Um, now, as you said, some other people were just happy to see sticky peaks uh, and uh, perhaps naively thought that it was Majorana, but there was also this optimistic era in the beginning, right? Where uh, there was no alternative possibility. Uh, a peak that is extended for so long, what else could it be, right? That was the thinking. So there were uh, papers like that published early on, but certainly in the later part, the, what I call the confusion era, uh, you could already be a little bit more responsible you could uh, look for cross checks uh, between different measurements. A more specific question. What is the difficulty in uh, sort of respecting the two ends uh, ingredient? Um, I mean, what are you seeing in your experiment? Those are like Andre bound states or? Yeah, yeah. So the there are two wave functions uh, on the two ends, but there is no connection between them. They are they have independent energies, independent uh, wave functions, the different, uh, yeah, the different eigenstates of the system. Um, so, I mean, there is no uh, methodological difficulty. You just make this experiment, it's slightly more complicated, but nothing crazy. Uh, if uh, Carlos remembers our experiment from UBC. There were 18 gates and uh, you know, seven contacts. Yeah. And uh, okay, uh, it's a little bit hard, but 
whatever. Um, and uh, to be honest with you, a lot of the devices that were made uh, over these years also have a, another contact, just uh, not shown in the picture. I, I did it myself uh, because it didn't work. So sometimes it just doesn't work, doesn't conduct. Uh, so there's some yield problems um, of just uh, lab nature, usual lab stuff. Um, but other times, uh, yeah, it would just don't show it because it doesn't make sense. It contradicts your Majorana thinking. And then we just don't show it. Well, okay. not we, but people. Okay. And that's is this true for the is this true for the the retracted nature paper? Um I actually for that paper, I don't know if they uh, no, because um, there is a good reason for that. Uh, because uh, that paper, they used um, a wire with this aluminum shell. And uh, you cannot make a third contact to the shell because you will disturb uh, the, the nanowire. So uh, those kind of measurements are fundamentally two terminal. And uh, some of the... Some of the papers here that show number one and number four are fundamentally two terminal. They cannot be three terminal. So thank you for reminding me of that. So that's, uh, uh, I, I forgot to mention it in my initial answer that, uh, that that is one reason why it's not been done in every, in every experiment. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, Sergey, if you allow me, um, can I, let me just comment on on, on this um, criteria, which I found. I mean, you're you're clever. You know, for those uh, old enough to remember the beginning of quantum computing, there's the famous De Vincenzo criteria. You know, the five De Vincenzo criteria, five plus two. Later on, it was uh, complemented to include flying qubits and stuff. So I think it. You know, there's a value. It's not. It's a very important thing, I think. This, uh, if it turns out to be, you know, um, uh, a good set of criteria, because it's it sort of systematized, you know, the, the search. You know, you really, and, and I think it was a great advance, you know, in, in quantum computing. You know, in, in many different, uh, you know, uh, for many different platforms, right? Trapped ions, and quantum dots, nuclear spins, whatever, because people would go down this criteria. And I think what you're trying to do here, is, you know, it, it's it's valuable. Um, has, have people actually tried to complement this by adding, or yourself, um, adding um, additional things that you thought about? Because I'm going to be thinking yes. about this for now. Yeah. If, you, if you read Twitter, yes, people have tried. Uh, your friends theorists uh, were very unhappy with my set um, because uh, I did not include uh, the closing of the topological gap and reopening. Um, and uh, well, um, so there is a difference between this set and Di Vincenzo. I mean, in spirit, it is, uh, I guess, an effort to systematize the search. But these are very specific, right? These are for nanowires. They will not apply to other Majorana systems in this form. They could maybe be generalized, but uh, I have not tried to do that. Uh, so for spins on surfaces or other systems, it will be a different set of criteria. And the goal of this set is with the minimal effort in the experiment we already know how to do, these zero bias peaks, uh, without any additional you know, probes and measurements, to establish Majorana with high certainty. Okay? So... This is why I did not include, for instance, the closing and the reopening of the gap, because it may or may not be visible in a measurement, and it does not mean that there is not Majorana. Um, now, if I have a truly... But, 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 couldn't that be said about some of the other you know, you know, items in your list? Like you cannot measure the correlation for some reason. Yes, it and, could, but... But if I if I make the list too short, uh, then uh, you know the Andreev explanation gains uh, strength, right? 
But for instance, for the gap closing, if my wire is short, then my spectrum in the wire is discrete. It's a, it's a small box and particles in the box get discretized. Yeah. So there will not be a gap anymore, but there will still be at least partially separated Majoranas, which will uh, satisfy all five criteria uh, that I list on the screen, right? So I include for the possibility that the wire segment is short, we cannot work with a long wire, let's say due to residual disorder. And so that I don't include uh, this. I don't include quantized conductance, which is a theorist darling, right? And which led us on this wild uh, delusion for several years with the quantized Majorana paper. Uh, well, for obvious reasons. I mean, I, I can give you a quantized peak uh, and it won't be Majorana. This is in our nature physics paper of this year. So this is not a criterion that uh, is, uh, is realistic to include. Uh, but look, I mean, anyone can make their own list. I just think that this is the, this is long enough and easy enough and already hard enough that we haven't done it so far. Great. So All right. I really like this list, but it is not a, a law of physics or a law of the land. And this is just my opinion. All right. Thank you. Um, Sergey, can I? I did not follow uh, the talk because I had to leave. Um, but I see this list, and uh, I would have two questions about the list. Um, one of them is if you feel confident enough that these criteria suffice to claim Majorana. Uh, the second one may just be a graphic thing, but it looks like uh, you're optimistic that the confusion era ends in 2021. I hope so. <laughs> I hope we don't drag on this era into 2022. Uh, look, I well, I put the end here because look, there was this high profile retraction and it uh, made us all look more critically and talk you know, about what is being measured. And I hope we are all now thoroughly informed about the ways you can uh, fool yourself and we won't get fooled again, right? I mean, that's my hope. I cannot promise that it will happen. And for your first uh, question, um, so, uh, it will not be the ultimate proof of Majorana, but I think if you see these five things really in a self-consistent way that they all check together in one nanowire, in one measurement, uh, then the possibility of an alternative interpretation will be so diminished that we can be pretty sure. We can make more complex experiments with that system and find more proof in the future. Um, but you know, when you grow the body of evidence that is also connected, uh, this is uh, this is how you get out of this. And what also people sometimes suggest to me is things like, well, maybe we should do braiding, and that will prove my run, or maybe we should do another complicated experiment. No, uh, you know, braiding is hard, and other things are also hard. If you don't see my runa in the simple measurement tunneling into one end of the wire or two ends of the wire, you're not gonna see it in another more complicated experiment because your material is the same. Your wire is the same, your superconductor is the same. You will have the same disorder issues there. It's not a matter of a different probe or more complicated experiment. First see it in a simple setup, satisfy these five criteria, then we can have another discussion. Is this enough? Um, maybe just add, I don't know if you did comment, um, you said at the outset that we're not going to talk about the retracted paper in your talk, whether somebody asks about it. And uh, um, so I read uh, the report of the independent committee uh, about the paper. Um, and while I find it easy to agree with the assessment that 
no data was fabricated, right? That the experiments were all done. Um, I kind of had the impression myself that they went very easy on their conclusion saying that it's a confirmation bias and that's all. Um, would you care to give your opinion whether you think there was foul play beyond confirmation based bias? No, but I can still talk about this. Um, first of all, um, the affair is not finished. Uh, so they, they, the four respected experts that Delft University invited uh, have made a conclusion based on one paper. Uh, we have repeatedly asked Delft University to look at several papers by the same set of authors. So you can find what these papers are. Um, one of them is on the list here, for instance, this Google Nature Nano 2018 is one of the papers by the same set of authors. Um, and this has not been done, but we hope that it will be done. Uh, so we don't know the full scope of the situation. I can tell you that. Um, another thing I can tell you is, yes, data were not fabricated, but uh, what we found and the experts kind of agree is that data were manipulated inappropriately and data were uh, selected uh, with bias. And uh, according to us, it was extreme bias that invalidates the paper. So the bias is so large that the full data, if, it's, if you ignore the selection, look at the full data that was obtained, uh, does not support the claim of the paper. Okay. So those are the two main problems we found. We found a total of 10 sub problems that too tedious to go through. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess uh, we did not interview the authors in such detail as those experts did. So we don't have a basis to assign a specific kind of bias to their behavior or we don't know their motivation. Uh, but uh, we were very unhappy with their retraction notice, which misstated, for example, my role and the role of Vincent Maurick, my colleague who did the investigation. And we were very unhappy with their replacement paper because they took the same data and wrote a new paper. And we thought that that paper was inaccurate. So I can also tell you that. I, I, I think yeah. for, for me, you already said enough, thanks. Sure. Any other questions or comments? Uh, I would like a question. I'd like to ask a question if possible. Please go ahead. Um, so thanks for the seminar. I found it very interesting. So I am one of the students of Carlos' class. So I figured out it would be a good idea to ask a question. You get and it. One of the only things I understood was in the end when you spoke about the Jordan Wigner transformation. And my question is as far as I know, you're mapping fermionic operators to spin operators and vice versa. But the, fermi the fermionic operators with Majorana fermions, they're quite special. So, do you have to use some sort of a different approach to that, or you can do it just like we do it traditionally? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty traditional. Let's see if I deleted the slide on that from my talk or if it's still here, because I used to have an actual slide on Jordan Wigner transformation. Uh, oh, yeah. So this is what you do. So you, you go from a chain of spins to a chain of uh, Kitaev. And uh, so these chi and eta are Majorana operators the way I defined them for you in the beginning of the talk. Just uh, this is a copy paste from another paper. I believe it's by Gerd Schoen and coworkers. A beautiful paper that actually motivates how you can simulate it with spin, um, superconducting qubits. 
Uh, and yeah, this is just what you do. So this is these are the two Myrana operators, chi and eta. So chi and eta would be in one, two of the stars here. Chi, eta, chi, eta, chi, eta, chi, eta, chi, eta. And these are just uh, sigma z's, sigma x, sigma y's of a mapping spin uh, chain. Uh, so for instance, if you're on site n, right? Then you have this tail of sigmas. So you're on site n, you do sigma z n, and then a product of sigma x's that goes from one to n minus one. Okay, so you have a sigma z and a chain of sigma x's that go to the end of the, to the beginning of the chain. And for the other Myrona, it's sigma y and the tail of sigma x's. And then, uh, okay, yeah, so this is how you map. And then if you do braiding, you kind of intermix the, the tails of, these uh, these tails of sigma x's they they wind around each other that's how i understand it but as far as jordan and Vinger transformation goes this is it it's, it's very easy to follow and uh, if you follow you will see that at the ends of the chain uh, well if you start with a spin chain and apply this you will see two unpaired majoranas at the ends of the chain of the mapped chain does that make sense yeah yeah it does um and just out of curiosity, could you do that for a two-dimensional chain, for instance? Well, in a, I mean, uh, you can apply jordan Wigner transformation to any system, of course, right? Uh, now, if you if you make a two-dimensional chain of Kitayev chains, uh, then your entire bulk will be gapped out because um, you will have... Um, like uh, more Majorana is top and bottom and they will all couple together. So you will just end up with an edge Majorana mold. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So Guilherme, you gave me a great idea. Maybe I should ask all my students to ask questions next time, or maybe there's still time if they are around. I'm yeah. sorry, guys. You can send me questions. Maybe the homework will be to ask Sergey five questions. <laughs> That's actually good homework. I'm great. I'm getting <laughs> great ideas here. Yes. Wait yeah. a minute. What did I sign myself up? How many students do you have? <laughs> Seven. <laughs> Seven is still manageable. Uh, there's something in the chat. Okay. No, I'll just ask uh, some of your questions on Twitter. Uh, you can also do that. Twitter is very powerful. Yep, I agree. I did not expect it. I only joined one year ago, and I am overwhelmed with the power of Twitter. I joined uh, longer ago, but I've started using it in the past year. Um, yeah. I use Facebook quite a lot and I do actually learn a lot of physics, um, get in touch with a lot of things on, on these platforms. Yeah, it's wonderful. So, um, they can be very, very informative if you know how to use them. I agree. So um, I think we are out of questions or comments. Is that true? So if there are no further questions or comments, um, let's thank uh, Sergey again. Thanks um, everyone. And thanks everybody for open your, your mics and uh, let's make an appointment that hopefully next year we can invite Sergey for a colloquium in-house in 3D, in 3D. I will just come. You don't even have to listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for sticking around. Thanks for all the questions and for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Sergey. Thank you. Excellent talk. Thank you. Thanks. All right. All right, everybody. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks again. Bye. And Sergey. Bye. 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 Thanks a lot, Sergey. Right. Really. Thank you. Thanks a right. lot. Thanks for the invitation.
I'm going to have to catch up on, on YouTube. Um, no but from, from the little I saw, uh, it was very nice. I think people really appreciate it. I, I, I enjoyed the questions and uh, yeah, it's, it's great. Great opportunity for me. Thank you. Yeah, especially for us. Thanks a lot.